The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Brought to you by the Op Games, also known as USAopoly. This week, we are talking about Harry Potter Death Eaters Rising. This game takes the rising mechanic we love to the next level for Harry Potter fans, and it comes with an awesome Voldemort sculpt. The Dice Tower, Episode 650, San Jose. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, we talk about games set in Egypt, space, and a lovely autumn forest, relive our recent aptastic game, Epic, and we answer a few questions in Q&A. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And it's so nice to be back, Mandy. We missed you at Dice Tower West. I know, I'm sad. It was a lot of fun, though, I must say. (laughs) Now, because you're going to Aircon... Mm Mm-hmm. We're actually recording this a little bit earlier than we normally would, so I don't even know what Tom and Eric are saying about Dice Tower West. So apologies, y'all, if there's any kind of overlap, because I don't know what the guys are talking about. But I know. We've been trying to, I'm trying to get ready to go, so I haven't had a chance to catch up on a few things. But I wanted to say thank you to everybody who I got to meet at Dice Tower West. As usual, the Dice Tower conventions are just so much fun. I think we can all agree the library was phenomenal. I mean, just game after game after game. I was looking at that. I was like, I want to play that. I want to play that. It was a really well curated and really well stocked library. So kudos to the Dice Tower convention team on that front. I got to do so much. We had a blast at the live show, which if you're a podcast subscriber, you may have already heard it. It is also available on YouTube, which I encourage you to check out because... Eric and Crystal wore their bunny hats and used them to accent some moments during the show, which was pretty entertaining. And overall, beyond just having a great time with everybody at Dice Tower West, I got to explore some of the new games from AEG specifically because they were there all over the place showing them off. And in fact, I'll be talking about one this episode. I got to try, Mandy, Mm -hmm. the super duper prototype, but I got to try the new Sports Highlights Roland Wright game by Mike Fitzgerald. Ooh. So it's like a Roland Wright kind of take on baseball highlights and football highlights. And I just got to say, oh, keep your eye out for this one. It was combo-tastic. I loved it. That's amazing. I mean, I only played the prototype, so <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> and unfortunately... I do have some new fodder for one and done segments in the future, too. Oh, dear. (laughs) That's the nice thing about conventions, in a way, is that I can explore games that were interesting to me. And then if I don't end up liking them, it's no big deal. I got to try it in a fun environment with great people. So I had a great experience no matter what. And then I didn't spend the, you know, 20 to $60 on a game I ended up not enjoying. So that'll be fun to talk about over the next weeks and months. Looking forward to it. It's exciting times. <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful time at Aircon. Now, I'm trying to think about when this episode will drop. This episode will actually drop after Aircon is over. So you'll be winging your way home yes. when this episode hits the airwaves. Exactly. So I'll be a little, I think <laughs> I'll be tired coming in on the Monday. But then I'll be like, ah, oh, our podcast has dropped. And, you know, hear all the things. I'm like, wait a second. I was just at Aircon and we're talking. It's, it's a weird thing. T- hearing yourself talk about something and you've already done it it's for strange. sure do you know so Absolutely. i'm looking forward to telling everybody about all the good things when i'm there i know the brothers murph are there already and a few other people so i'm looking forward to it i hope you have a great time and remind future mandy to stay hydrated and use hand sanitizer and have a great time And I'll look forward to hearing all about Aircon when you get back. And I say that because, unfortunately, while I had been planning on attending, some personal life stuff came up and I've had to cancel my attendance. So I'm really going to miss going. I'm pretty actually sad (laughs) that I don't get to go. I was really looking forward to it. But, Mandy, I know that, that you will have extra fun on my behalf, right? Absolutely. You know it. So, what have you been playing lately? Well, 
All right, I played a lot of little games over the past week, and the one I'm going to start with first is Stellar. And this is designed by Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. Art is by Tim Barton and Janos or- uh, Orban, and published by Renegade Game Studios. And this game retails for about $19. It's a two-player game, and it plays in about 30 minutes, and I think they've classified it as hand a hand management type game. For those who have not listened to the podcast before, some of the pricing that you'll hear um, for myself, I take from Board Game Bliss on the Canadian side and Cool Stuff Inc. on the American side. So let us dive right in. So in Stellar, this is the description they give that you are stargazers and you're calibrating your telescopes to bring into view celestial objects of various types, planets, moons, asteroids, interstellar clouds, black holes, even satellites, as you create a beautiful display of the night sky. Oh, that's nice. That is fairly accurate. The game is played over 11 rounds, and you're playing cards to your telescope and to your notebook, and you want to build this beautiful tableau, and the most points wins. So this is kind of different. I have to kind of explain it a little backwards, otherwise you're going to have absolutely no idea what I'm saying. Okay. A little bit. So basically, at the end, you know, you know, it has that many rounds, you have your telescope that's set up, and they're basically cards that are set up in tiers. And the picture that's on once you've set the cards up is like, a, it looks like a young person looking through a telescope. It's really cool. But cards will be covering that as you play. And then you'll have a little empty area beside that where you're going to put your cards in your notebook. The game has, uh, there's, it's funny, because there's a lot going on. But it's a small game. So we've got your telescope, you've got your notebook area, and then we have other cards set up that are labeled one, two, three, four, five. And we're going to actually put cards under each of these cards in a display. And then we have our stack of cards. That is literally all that you're playing with. Okay, so you've got your notebook, your telescope, and this display. In the game, there are five different types of cards, which are basically like suits. So I don't know if you've played, you know, when you think of playing cards, like hearts, diamonds, that sort of thing. In this one, they have different types of planets. You know, they're yellow, uh, orange, purple, that sort of thing. On a turn, you're going to add a card to your hand. Okay. And then from that, you have to add one card to your telescope or your notebook. Now, these cards, remember I said they have suits. They also have numbers. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. We have some other special cards, but I'll talk about that in a moment. We take a card and we now place a card in our telescope or notebook. If you place in the telescope, you must place it adjacent to another card of the same type. Okay, so if there are none there, you can place it wherever. But if there's one already there of the same type or same suit, you have to place it adjacent to it. So now take note of the card you place because you will now place a card directly from the display. You choose a card that is the same number slot as the number card you just played. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? So if you had in, put in your telescope, for example, a five, remember I told you about that display that was numbered one, two, three, four, five? You're going to go to the number five and pick that card up. And now you have to play that in wherever you didn't play that first card, either your notebook or your telescope. So you really have to pay attention about the number you're placing because, hey, that card is in the display is what you're going to place out. If you cannot place this card, uh uh-oh, the card is turned upside down and placed in your telescope and is not counted in scoring. So if you're placing in your telescope but you can't place it, it goes upside down. So this is not going to count when you have to score. There are other cards like the 6 slash 0 card and this one when it's played in a telescope, it's always a 6. Which is like, oh, well, that's really good. It is. And it, there, it, it, it's going to count toward a majority. And we'll talk about that when we talk about scoring. When this six slash zero card is played in your notebook, it can be a six or a zero. You're thinking, this notebook, what is it about? The notebook is going to help you score. So what you want to do is you want to have the different suits present in your notebook, you want to have them laid out in ascending order, like one, two, three, four, five, if you can, because you know, you may not always get the cards, you might get a one, two, and then it jumps to five. Scoring is important with these cards, because it's going to take your longest run of a certain suit, and it's going to be used as a multiplier. So if you have one, two, three, and then five, six, 
one, two, three. So that's one, two, three cards. That'll be used as a multiplier. So three times. And then we'll tell you about what you're going to use to score. If you have it in your in your telescope, you want to also have at least a run of those cards in your notebook. We also have satellites and they count as wild in your notebook. So, you know, if you're missing a number, you can just pop that right in to take over the number that you're missing. Uh, and again, we'll help with your consecutive run of cards. The game ends when your display is full. Okay, so remember we talked about the rounds because we end up placing one in the beginning. So it's about 11 rounds total. For scoring, there are a few things you want to look at. So scoring section majorities in tiers. So remember I was telling you the telescope, it's in a kind of tiered way that you set it up. There are majorities in different parts of that. So what you're actually going to do is count the physical number on each card in the tiers and see, oh, okay, I have a total of 15. Maybe your opponent has a total of 13. Oh, great. I win majority for that tier of the telescope. And I think we do it for the three tiers in the telescope. Then you want to score cards in your tableau. So in your telescope, the cards you've placed, you're hoping to have placed cards with, you know, a lot of stars on them. There'll be little stars on the corner of the card. For each suit, so let's say I'm going to do the purple ones with the purple planets on them. And I look at all the cards that are purple. Oh, great. I have one, two, three, four, let's say six stars total on all my purple cards. Then I look at the run of purple cards that I have in my notebook. So let's say it's a run of one, two, three. So three cards in that run, three times six, 18. So you multiply that by the stars that are on the cards for that, for that suit. And you do that for all of them. Then you also get a diversity bonus. So you have all five suits in your telescope. So that's always a nice little add on for your scoring. So most points wins. I liked this game a lot. I was like, Oh, I don't know. And then I'm starting to read the rules. I'm like, Oh, this sounds confusing. Once you wrap your head around it, because I was trying to do things and I was kind of doing it out of order. And then it kind of came together. It was a little puzzly brain started hurting a little bit, but in a good way. You know what I mean? It didn't yeah, it wasn't overly lengthy. I found it was probably the first game probably took us about 45 minutes just to kind of get the rules down and figure it out. And then after that, I'm like, yeah, this is totally something I could play during lunch hour. It's two player. So keep that in mind. And but this is one I would I think I would keep and I don't keep a lot of two player games because I don't get to play them very right. often. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it went over really well. Card quality and all that sort of thing was normal average. Like I don't think it was amazing, but normal, which I think is fine. The art on the game, I'm going to be honest, the cards didn't really stand out to me, but I did like the way the telescope looked with the art on the telescope. Okay. I know there were people who had some complaints about some of maybe the text or some of the pictures that were depicting certain types of planets. People didn't think they were 100% accurate. I'm not a specialist of the planets, so I couldn't <laughs> tell you. Um, but they did have some, you know, really nice kind of flavor text on the cards. And I mean, I'm all about learning. So I thought that was uh, really nice as well. The person I played it with, they actually borrowed my copy. <laughs> so Dave, if you're listening, nice. I hope you're enjoying it. As uh, they really enjoyed it. And I played it with another friend. And she really enjoyed it as well. Overall, Stellar was a really good game. I think it's just out. It's a newer game. But I definitely think if you're looking for a kind of a different two player game, and it's just cards, right? Mm -hmm. I really like the way they maneuver the cards. So, Stellar, I think you should try it. It's pretty good. I got to tell you, that Pinchback Riddle design duo is really a favorite duo of mine. I don't know what they do. In fact, the last game I played at Dice Tower West was one of their games called Ladder 29 that I reviewed ages and ages ago. On oh, the, I did on a review for that one, too. Yeah. I love that little card game. It's so clever. And, and like, Fleet... Or Fleet Dice. Fleet mm -hmm. Dice is a great roll and write game. I I'll tell you, the 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 pinch the ridback, the ridback <laughs> design duo. I'm there. The ridback. <laughs> I can't wait to play it. All right, I got to play the newest roll and write game coming from Stronghold Games at Dice Tower West, and I. Long story, I played a half game, had to run away from the table, but came back and played a few more games. And let's talk about it. Ripple Rush is designed by Ken Gruel, published by Stronghold. It plays one to five, and it's going to retail for $20. And it fits right along with all of the other Roll and Write games that Stronghold has in their category, like Dizzle and Gonshan Clever and things like that. Same box size, and they've even done the cover art to kind of make it look like it fits in that family. But while... Those other titles are games that Stronghold has partnered with somebody from Europe to publish. Ripple Rush is just a straight out Stronghold game. 
So Ripple Rush, you're going to get your sheets of paper, your deck of cards, because it's a roll and write slash flip and write, and some goal cards. And you're going to have 25 cards, one through 25, in four different suits, essentially. And then on your sheet, you just have five different columns. And four of those columns are those suits as well. Just they're color coded and shape coded for colorblindness. So there's the green hexagon and the yellow triangle and whatnot. The color shape doesn't really matter. What happens is you scale the deck. So depending on the number of players, you'll remove some cards. And then players each draw a card simultaneously flip it over and then based on the card they revealed they will fill in that number on their own personal sheet so if i draw a card and it's the 15 green then i have to write a 15 in my green column i can write it anywhere in my column but when you write a number in a column it always has to ascend from the bottom to the top it doesn't have to be sequential but you can go 1 3 5 19 22 what have you Always has to go from low to high, bottom to top. Basically, you're going to keep on drawing those cards. You get bonuses. So if you fill in all the spots in a row, there are the other column has bonuses based on filling in a row. So you may get to write a 15 anywhere on your sheet, or you may get to fill in any number of your choice in a specific column, that kind of thing. So that's another factor as you're filling it in. You keep on playing through the entire deck, and then you're going to score each column and the highest score wins. So some of the twists in the game that make it interesting. First of all, if you draw a card and you cannot fill it in your sheet, then you share it with everybody else. So if I draw the 20 yellow card and I can't fill it in because I've already filled in 17 and 22 right next to each other and there's no gap for it, then I have to say, oh, can't play this card and show it to everybody else. And then everybody else gets to write that number in their column. And then the scoring itself is based on the most spaces in a completed run in a column. So as you're as you're filling in, you're going to find, oh, I drew a 15. Well, I'm not going to put a 15 at the bottom. I'm going to put it somewhere in the middle. Well, then I draw a 20. Does the 20 go at the very tippy top or am I hedging my bets that I'm going to get access to a number higher than 20. So I don't want to leave it. So you're going to, as you're filling in your sheet, you're leaving these gaps. And at the end of the game, for each column, you score the most number of spaces that are filled in consecutively. And then that'll be your score. On top of that, there are these goal cards. There are a couple random ones assigned each game that will give you special bonus points for a specific row in the game as well. It is very, very simple. It is very, very quick and easy to teach. It is very, very quick to play. Straightforward game. And I really have to say, I really, really liked this. The simplicity is part of the appeal to it. But that open writing where you draw a number and you can put it anywhere. And so you're trying to play the odds of what numbers you're going to have access to later in the game as the sheet gets more filled in, it gets a little more tense as you have fewer options. The ability to get those bonuses across rows is quite clever because you find sometimes that you have a card that you'd like to put in this one spot, but if you put it in the spot lower down, it completes a row and you really want that bonus. So there's a little bit of a choice there. I found that the drawing of cards, we ended up, dividing up the deck and kind of putting stacks for multiple players to reach. But it was dynamic and it was energetic. And really, the hardest part of the game was making sure people were taking their turns at the same time, because it would be really easy for somebody to get a little bit ahead, which you don't want to do. You want everybody to be taking turns at the same time. But I think that really great combo that you often get to see in roll and write games of simple rules, easy to teach, fun to play, quick to play, but it has just enough bite to keep it interesting. Ripple Rush has that in spades. I love that you can play it solo. I love that it plays up to five. I think it fits really well in all the other roll and rights in the Stronghold catalog. And I really like it. I can't wait to play it more. It was a solid game. When is this one coming out? I don't, I've never heard of it. I hadn't either. And there was a ah. bit of a thing. We oh. had a moment. Oh, dear. Because I saw it and I was like, wait a minute, a stronghold roll and write? Stephen Bonacore knows how I feel about roll and write games. Yeah. How had I not heard about this game? So I see Bonacore at Dice Tower West and I'm kind of razzing him about it. 
And Eric walks up and goes, oh, is that the game you just sent me, Steven? <laughs> and oh, I said, what? <laughs> and sure enough, Eric had his copy of Ripple Rush in his bag with him. Oh, I gave Steven the... Oh, I glared at him so hard. But all is well. It's a fun game. It's affordable. It'll be available shortly in your friendly local game store. And if you like this genre, this one is a solid one to check out. Ripple Rush. Oh, well, another one to add to the old list. Bosk. So this is designed by fellow Canadians, Daryl Andrews and Erica Bjoris. Art is by Quanchai Moria and another Canadian, Matt Paquette. And it's published by Floodgate Games. Yes, I have to give props to us Canadians because I feel there are so few of us out there in the gaming world. Oh, I love your patriotism. It's adorable. (laughs) Gotta represent. Wow, that was really lame. (laughs) This retails for about $42. And uh, yeah, so this plays uh, up to four players. So, Bosk. I had to look up the definition. So the definition of bosk is a thicket of bushes, a small wood. Well, isn't that just funny? Because the game has to do with trees in the woods. Perhaps uh-huh. a I see thicket? what they did there. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting. So they're basically talking about the different seasons, you know, and, and their description is that players grow their trees, scoring as hikers, enjoying traveling the trails in the summer. And then when the autumn comes, the leaves fall in the direction of the wind over, you know, the different types of terrain that you would find in a forest. And then points are awarded in the winter for most coverage of each kind of terrain or region in the park. So it's played, like I said, over the four seasons. There's two playing seasons, which I discussed, and then two scoring seasons. So this is where it gets a little interesting. So in the spring, players place, or grow, each of their eight trees, uh, and they're numbered one to four, on intersection of the grid lines on the park board. So in the game, each player gets their own trees, like literally three-dimensional kind of cardboard trees. And they come in different colors, obviously player colors. And the board is kind of gridded off but then it's over the terrain so you can see the really nice terrain but the grid and where you can place your trees and you're trying to place them for this part of the game on the kind of intersections there's a reason why you want to be a little you know strategic placing these so that's what we do in the spring in the summer this is when the hikers come for a visit players score points for having the highest or second highest total value from trees in each row and column so what ends up happening is Each row gets scored. So let's say I had my purple tree that was worth two in a row and Suzanne had her four tree in that same row. Suzanne would win (laughs) that row. (laughs) I know. (sighs) And so we do that for each row and each column. So that's why you kind of want to spread it out a little bit and try not to be, you know, concentrate your trees in too much of the same area. And you get points for first place and second place. Good so far? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so then we go into autumn. So this is where the the wind starts to blow the leaves in fall. Okay, and I don't know how else to describe it. That's literally what it is. We actually have a bag full of leaves. Leaves. Did I just say leaves? Wow. Oh, my goodness. Leaves. (laughs) We get a bag full of leaves that we're going to be spreading out on the board. So the wind, there's a wind board, and it determines the which tree and the direction in which these leaves will be blown. So in the first round, it'll be all your one tree. So you're basically going to pick a tree that's marked number one, and then you're going to be placing leaves from that based on the direction of the wind. We also have a little squirrel, and if you're like, ha, 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 I don't want anyone to place any leaves on this spot, you can place your squirrel, or if there are leaves there already, you can place your squirrel on top. No more leaf placing there. (laughs) So you've basically claimed that specific spot. The reason why this uh, the placement of leaves is important is because you don't want other players obviously covering up your leaves because only the top leaf that's showing is going to be scored and you want majorities in the terrains. So, you know, you want to spread those out and keeping in mind when you're picking how many leaves to go out, it's based on you have these cardboard leaves which have numbers and those are the ones you're going to say, oh, I'm going to pick five leaves and put those out. And then next turn, maybe you'll do seven. But you only have so many leaves and so many of these numbers to put them out. So you want to play them. Timing is important here. Winter, we do another scoring. And this time, it's just what I said, majority for leaves in an area by players. 
And there's, again, first and second place scoring. And then basically at the end of that, the highest scoring player is the winner. This game, let's start off by saying it's pretty. I know. Oh, so pretty. It is. It's gorgeous. I mean, the art is amazing. The colors are nice. There was one spot on the board we had a little bit of difficulty with. I mean, it wasn't a huge deal, but the water kind of area where it transcends into like a calm kind of water into a rockier type of area, right in the middle, that was kind of hard to read. But other than that, I thought the the board was very clear as to where the lines were and, you know, lines of demarcation were into the next terrain. So I thought that was pretty clear. The trees are fun. I mean, I like the fact that you had something that you could hold on to and, you know, it was a kind of three-dimensional and you could visualize it on the board. So you really were kind of immersed in that theme. So kudos to that. I, I, I thought that was really fun. I liked, it's funny, the person I played or the people that I played with, one of the people I played with was just placing trees. And I was like, wow, they're really good at this. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you're literally placing, like, what you're doing now, you're like winning all of these. He's like, really? I had no idea. He's like, I was just strategically trying to place them. So when I had the wind blow, you know, the leaves would pan out. It was like he was doing it without even thinking about it. And I thought that was really cool. So in the fact that you could play this game, and you weren't super stressed out, but you were still kind of being strategic at the same time. Actually, now that I think about it, this game's kind of mean, because you could literally place a tree close to someone, blow their leaves. Oops, sorry, covering your leaf. You don't get that terrain but in a nice and pretty way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to explain that. So I, I, the components were really nice. I thought the theme was really well laid out in this game. You felt like, you know, you were growing, you felt the seasons change. And for me, that's, it's hard to get a lot of theme in games, especially lately. So I really can appreciate this. And uh, overall, I thought the component quality was very good. And we enjoyed it. Uh, I think setting it up at first, you know, just learning the rules, it was like, okay, we're trying to wrap our head around little things like the scoring, making sure we're doing that right. But it's not difficult. Once you get it, it's pretty straightforward. So Bosk for me was a win. I I quite enjoyed this. I like Bosk too. My biggest complaint about Bosk is I found it fiddly because I will say that, yes, the game is beautiful. Yes, the components are high quality, but you have to stack those little leaf tokens and they're all different shapes, which is a lot of fun to look at and it feels great as a player where you have a specific one that represents you and that's really nice. But we found that they didn't stack well mm. and, and you have to stack them, right, to show it's who true. has control and who's on top. So we were that was a little fiddly during play. And then because you have the trees, there's moments where you have the trees and then the leaves and you're looking and you have to see where you want to breeze onto yes and the trees would kind of get in the way so there's a lot of craning your neck and trying to twist around and see what you your options are and that felt just a little fiddly too so that is just a little bit of fiddliness sure i think is my biggest criticism but i really like that two-phase play where you really feel like you can plan ahead and try to optimize and it's a gorgeous game and I think that they made Canadians proud, Mandy, with Bosque. Yay! So happy. I was hoping to see some, like, maple leaps in there, you know, but alas, there were none. But that's okay. I'll let it slide. Um, but with the leaves, like you were saying, with the stacking, I just thought it was me because I had my nails were just really long. So I was like, oh, maybe it's just my nails getting in the way. But yes, I did find the craning for sure. You know, trying to see lining things up when you're, yeah, that was a bit of a thing. So I totally see what you're talking about. So Bosk, check it out. Another Dice Tower West game that I'm going to talk about now because I can't hold back. I, I cannot stop myself from talking about it is Cubitos. Cubitos, little cubes from Alderac Entertainment Group. This is a John D. Clare design. John also designed Space Base and Mystic Veil vale and is quite prolific. The art is by Jackie Davis, Philip Gofcheski, Ryan Eiler, and Matt Paquette. Matt is such <laughs> a pro. Matt's everywhere. Jeez, Matt, take a break. Matt is literally. And Ryan Eiler, really, because Ryan Eiler is also a local. So Ryan and Matt are both local to me. Hello. <laughs> Well, there you go. So you can take some Canadian pride exactly. in, in Cubitos then. <laughs> I will just say that Cubitos is not out yet. The hope is that this is their Gen Con release from Alderac. That is their hope. If you're listening to this, then you are probably aware that there is a worldwide 
near pandemic called COVID-19 that it is impacting some manufacturing in China. So fingers crossed that they have Cubitos uh, in that Genton time frame. And I, I can't hold back because they had a prototype at Dice Tower West. And Mandy, I almost stole it. No, oh, no. I, I kept on joking I was going to steal it. And everybody went, ha, ha, ha. Oh, that's so funny. John, John Clare was, oh, ha, 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 ha. But you could tell. I, I could tell that he could he knew I was only half joking because he would kind of laugh. Ha ha ha. But you could tell he kept his eye on me with the game. He so wasn't like going to let it out of his sight with me near the game because he knew right. I was only half joking about stealing this game. I played Cubito six times. Six I saw times. a post about this one, actually. Right. I couldn't stop playing it. Spoiler alert. I like the game. Really? I couldn't tell. Shocking. Times. So Cubito's is a race game. That leverages pool building with dice. And I think what a lot of people were saying about it is it kind of felt like a mix of Quacks of Quedlinburg Hmm. and Automobiles, the racing game. And since I love Quacks and I love Automobiles, no wonder this one appealed to me. I was going to say, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and I know how you feel about Automobiles, but but we won't won't go there. (laughs) Hang in there with me, okay? <laughs> so basically, this is a pool builder or, or a deck builder with dice. You start off with a starting set of dice that are very simple. And they basically have mostly blank faces. And then they'll have a couple of hit faces that might represent money or movement. Because again, this is a race game. You're going to roll those dice. You're going to set aside dice that hit. When you're done, you will spend those dice to do whatever they can do. If it's a money die, then you're calculating how much money you have, and then you can buy more dice, special dice, better dice. Or if it's feet, then you can just move around the racetrack, which is also good. The board has icons on some of the spaces, and if you land on that icon, then you get a special bonus. Maybe you get to cull a bad die out of your pool, or maybe you get some extra money, that kind of thing. Now, The quacks element is really a push your luck element because what happens is you're going to roll all these dice and then some dice will hopefully hit and some dice are going to roll blanks. You may scoop up those blanks and re-roll them and hey, if you get more hits, great. You've just got more money or more movement or more whatever. But if you Mm -hmm. get all blanks, which does happen quite (laughs) a lot, you bust and you get nothing. You get nothing. Nothing oh, for the turn. Not good. Well, not quite nothing, but we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> so that push your luck thing is so intense and it has so much energy. I, I know that it's not everybody's thing, but I was totally down for it in this game. So there is that kind of quacks push your luck thing going on. Mm-hmm. Now, there are just two basic starter dice and then there's 10 special dice you get to pick from and they're all Ooh. laid out. 10 different dice. They're all different colors. They all have a unique icon on them. There's like one with a little doggy icon. There's one with a kitty icon. There's one with a llama icon. (laughs) And again, they kind of pull into, they lean into the pixelated aesthetic, that little cubes, that cubito thing. They kind of really lean into it. Your player pieces look like little pixelated animals. They're adorable. And I got to say straight out, the aesthetic of these dice and the aesthetic of the game overall was super appealing to me. I didn't know when I've just seen the cover, and I'll be honest, I don't think the cover really, really portrayed how charming the components of this game are and how charming the package is all together when you look at all the components. Right. So you have all these special dice, and as you're rolling money icons, you're going to have a pool of money you can spend. First of all, you have 10 dice to pick from. And they range in price. Some are going to cost you $2. Some are going to cost you $15. And you really have to save up. And that's a later game thing that you're going to buy. When you buy that die, there's a card next to it that indicates the faces that are on that die. So you know what you're getting. And then a description of the special ability. So maybe you decide to buy a die that helps protect you from busting. Or maybe you buy a die that if you hit on the special face, you get three movement. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you buy one that gives you three money. But... If you roll the special phase, you get three money, but then you have to return the die to the pool. So you get a good thing, but then the die goes out of your, your, your entire pool. There's a lot of variety in just the options that present in a single game. More, 
over, similar to automobiles, each colored die has a stack of cards you can choose from. Hmm. So there's one little bundle of green dice. But there are like seven or eight cards associated with that green die. And you only play with one of them per game. So in a given game, your green die could have, will have totally separate special abilities game to game. And that's for every single special die in the game. So the variety and variability is intense, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then there's two boards included and they're double-sided tracks. So there are four different racetracks. There's a simple kind of go around. And then there's like a swirl, like a, an S one with all sorts of curves. And then there's one with a lot of water. And oh my gosh, there's a lot of variety in that, those tracks as well. So from a replayability point of view, which I don't like to overemphasize personally, right. but boy, oh boy, Cubitos has replayability in spades, absolute spades. Another small detail, all these cards have goofy names. Really, the cards, the special face on the die represents a character. The card and die is a character in the game. Mm -hmm. And so one of the dice, the purple die is a little dinosaur. And maybe the dinosaur's name is Rolosaurus. Or the little white kitty die <laughs> Maybe you're playing with Smelly Cat. Literally, there's a Smelly Cat die. Wait, like as in, wait, there's something about Smelly Cat. Friends, smelly cat. yeah, friends. Okay, and, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, there's they've given, there's, what was it? There's a doctor one. There's all, they, they all have these goofy names. And you all know, I'm not a huge theme person, but this game was so darn charming. And these goofy names were so silly and fun. I was drawn into it. You're not saying, I want a purple die. You're saying, I want a Rolosaurus. When you're rolling your dice, you're literally like, come on, smelly cat. Or <laughs> come on, reckless cheese. Roll the cheese. Oh, my goodness. That's, it just had the goofiest, most fun energy. And I'm not usually a theme person, but boy, oh, boy, I couldn't get away from it in this one. I think that the strategy, the thoughtfulness of how you build your pool... Even the tactical push your luck is quite intelligent. So I can talk about the goofiness, the theme, the components, whatever. But when it comes down to it, the game is a solid gameplay experience. Yes, there's some luck. There's a lot of dice in the game. Yes, there's the push your luck. But hey, you choose to push. There's a catch up mechanism. If you bust, you get to move up what's called the fan track. Mm -hmm. And as you're going down the fan track, certain spots that you hit will have bonuses that you get, including increasing your dice pool limits so literally during the game there are moments you're like well maybe i want to bust this time maybe i don't mind if i bust this time because i want to get up that fan track because i want to expand my dice pool mm -hmm. so those are all the little gameplay details that really elevate it to a game that is highly playable the energy is intense it's goofy it's fun it's got a nice balance of luck and strategy I am completely charmed by it. I had a blast. I am upset I didn't steal the prototype because I want to play it again tomorrow. <laughs> I love Cubitos. I can't wait until it hits the market. I know they're working on expansion. One of the things they talked about is that it plays up to four in uh -huh. the base box. But really, they talked about how it could play easily up to six without any oh. additional downtime because you are doing a lot of simultaneous play. But it just would have increased the cost of the game too much for a base game because of all the extra little dice they would have had to throw in. So right. just from a cost point of view, it didn't make sense. But I know they have an expansion in the works with even more dice, and I'm in on that too. So Cubitos, Quacks of Quedlinburg with automobiles, really fun game. Highly recommend it. Ugh, darn it. I, <laughs> I, 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 waiting to Gen Con is going to be difficult for me. Is it okay? I was gonna say, is it coming to Kickstarter? But it's gonna be a Gen Con release potentially. Yep, this is a Gen Con one. Ah, okay, exciting. I know you posted a lot of pictures of it. It looked really fun. So I I'm, couldn't stop. <laughs> no, I noticed. So I gotta, I gotta try this one. So I, we must be on the dice trajectory here because now I'm gonna talk about a game that literally has dice in the title. So Dice Hospital, and this one is not a new, new one. It's been out for a little while. 
uh, designer Stan Kor- uh, Kordonsky and Mike Nud. The artist is Sebastian Kosner and Sabrina Miramon, and it's published by Alley Cat Games. Uh, it retails for about $55 for the standard edition, and that's the one that I'll be talking about today, but there is a deluxe version, and I think it runs closer to the $80 price point. Uh, it's, oh, as the name suggests, there are dice, so there's dice rolling and worker placement. It plays in about 45 to 90 minutes, and it's for one to four players. Okay, so that's kind of fun. So in Dice Hospital, you're basically trying to treat your patients and treat as many of these patients as possible and, well, get them out of the hospital. That sounds really crass. That's not how I meant it. Treat them so they can go home. Okay. <laughs> so in the game, players have their hospital staff. So they, I think they're supposed to represent nurses, uh, which are going to use to take actions uh, in order to help treat these patients, as well as calling in specialists and other things again, to treat your patients. So to start, players are going to get the three nurses I was talking about. You'll get your own board, which will have various areas for actions. And you'll have, uh, this is where you're also going to keep your patients, which are the dice in this game. And you also start the game with a special ability. So, you know, that's this is your person and they have something that's going to get you additional scoring. Then the specialists, so these are things that are going to allow you to have more action, so they come with an extra little meeple and an ability, and some special tiles are going to be laid out, and then there are going to be the ambulances, which are basically these cards with spaces to hold dice. Depending on your player count will depend how many of these ambulances come out, and they're numbered one through four, depending again, player count. So the first player is going to take this bag full of dice, shake, 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 pull the dice out, and now they come in yellow, green, red, I think those are the main colors, and they roll the dice. And then they end up placing the dice on the ambulance, on each of the ambulances, excuse me, and they place them in lowest to highest. So they're going in ascending order. So if you roll like twos, some threes and fours, the twos are going to go on the first ambulance and then the threes and the fours and so forth. Then after that happens, we get to choose an ambulance. So obviously it will be based on turn order and depending on who's first player, they're going to get to choose first. Now, if you pick a lower valued ambulance... It means you're going to go first in the next round, which is important because this is where you're going to get your specialists and ti- extra tiles potentially to put out in your game board. So it's giving you more spaces if you choose to go that route. So after uh, everyone picks their ambulances, first player gets a blood bag. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a good thing. It- <laughs> It's good. You're giving your patients blood to get better. So it's a kind of like a wild sort of token, if you will. And um Yes, and so people put their patients in the uh, their hospital once they get their ambulance. And then in the next round, or part of that round, the first player gets to choose either a specialist or a tile they can add to their board as an action. So once that's done, now it's simultaneous here. Everybody is treating their patients. And when they mean treating, basically you need your die to be a 7 to have it treated. So basically, if you don't have it a 7... We're going to talk about what happens there. But once you've hit that seven, it goes into your kind of outpatient area and then we'll score. So there are actions such as, you know, if you have a green die, treat this green die. Basically, it allows you to turn a green die up by one. So it's always usually by one unless you have a specialist that gives you some sort of ability if you use that particular meeple on a spot. After you've treated all your patients, if there are some that you're like, "Uh oh, I couldn't treat them. So, you know, there's nothing I could do. Well, I mean, they're not getting better, so you decrease the value of the die by one. So this is why you don't want low numbers, because, you know, if you're not treating patients and they're not able to get out of the hospital, that's not good for you. You end up taking one of these tokens with, like, crossbones and stuff. So that's that can't be a good thing. So once you have outpatients, so that round ends, once we do all that, you have your outpatients, and then you score based on the amount of dice that are going out. And you do that for, I think, depending on player count, we played with three, so it's about eight rounds. And at the end of the eight rounds, whoever has the most points wins. This is a kind of game, I don't know how to explain it. I see why people like it. Is it a game for me specifically? No. I feel this is a game that I would play and I would get tired of it. Oh, okay. Do you know what I mean? But it's kind of, but it's a game that I can understand why people like it because, you know, if you have a younger, I don't say younger children, but if you have, you know, kids at home, maybe closer to your, you know, like your children's age, they might enjoy that sort of thing. And you could enjoy that playing as a family. The group that I played with, they really liked it. And then I played it with another group and they were like, "Mm, not for me, but it just wasn't their type of game. Do you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's Mm -hmm. a bad game. I just think a certain 
group or type of people will be attracted to it. Um, obviously, dice, not everybody likes the dice play. I thought it was really fun having the dice as patients and you're able to manipulate them with your actions and that decision of, oh, do I get a tile or do I get a specialist? It's important. I ended up having a ton of specialists and nowhere to put them. So, you know, things like that you have to consider. And then they have these cards you can use that come out at the beginning of every round and it's either a good thing or a bad thing that happens. So that changes it up a little bit. So, the, you know, the, the parts of the game, the components were really good. I don't have the deluxe, but I know the deluxe has actual like ambulance that you can put your dice in. So apparently it's quite fancy. So I could definitely see the appeal. Um, it's just not a game for me that I would keep long term. I played it. It was fine. I enjoyed it. And I'm moving on from it. So Dice Hospital, while not for me, I think it is something that people can uh, definitely look into, especially if you have a family or heck, if you just like rolling dice <laughs> and treating patients. <laughs> wow, that sounds really bad. Like, I don't want to treat Nothing says family like a good old oh, blood bag. Oh, so bad. oh, yeah, I didn't I didn't sell that very well, did I? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to wrap up and talk about Emotep the Duel. Some of y'all may be familiar with Emotep, which was a Spiel de Jahres winner, I believe, Mandy. Mm-hmm. And this one's designed by the same designer, Phil Walker Harding. The art is by Miguel Coimbra, Michaela Keinel, and Klaus Stefan. It's published by Cosmos, and it retails in the U.S. for just $20. I always say this when I talk about a Cosmos two-player game, but I love this line of games. I just love the Lookout Spiel and the Cosmos two-player line of games. They almost always are good, at least to me, if not sometimes great. Mm -hmm. Emotep the Duel really does draw on a lot of the, certainly the theme and some of the mechanism or base mechanisms of Emotep. But optimized for this two-player experience. Basically, what you're going to get is a little board that's got a small 3x3 three three grid on it, uh, some boat tokens, which will feel familiar to the big game. Mm-hmm. And each player gets a player board that opens up like a little strip at, that you put in front of you. And these player boards represent the locations, similar again to Emotep. So maybe the pyramids or the obelisk or the tomb and things like that. And then there are just a whole bunch of tokens. So you don't have those big cubes. You have just a lot of tokens. Tokens will be randomly assigned to the boats face up so you know what you're getting. And this is a worker placement game. So you each have your own workers in, you know, I think blue or white. And on your turn, you can either place a worker out into that grid you can, quote unquote, offload a boat or you can play an action tile if you have one. So the boats are lined up with this grid so that there's a boat in each row and each column. You're going to put your worker out and then another person's going to put a worker out. And you're going to put a person. When there are two workers, at least in a row or column, you may offload the boat. So you take that as your action and you give out the tokens that are on the boat to the player's based on where their worker is. And then you take those workers off the board. And boy, oh boy, this felt clever. This was fun. I loved it. I'm a big fan of the game Targi, which Mm -hmm. is also part of the Cosmos two-player line. That's a great one. They don't feel iterative. They don't feel... There's nothing kind of mechanically that I associate, but it gave me that feel of that Targi worker placement where it's got just a little extra clever element to it. Mm -hmm. And boy, oh boy, I liked it. So you're putting these workers out based on what tokens you see. But then there's a little bit of this tension with your opponent because they're putting workers out. Well, are you, what if they clear the column instead of the row? Well, Mm. then Yeah, you could get the column token, but you were trying to get the row token. Your opponent can see your stuff and you can see theirs. So you kind of know what they're going for sometimes and that. So there's a little bit of denial drafting that can happen. There's a lot of visual optimization. That worker placement and token assignment is so great. 
When you get those tokens, then you put them in the appropriate slots on your player board. Pyramid tokens will go into one of the two pyramids. Obelisks will stack. And all of these things, similar to Emotep, score differently, which is great. The game ends when you can't refill the boats. So, you know, you offload a boat, it gets refilled. There's a bag of tokens. When you cannot refill the boats, they start leaving the port. So when they're offloaded, they go bye-bye. And the game ends when there's only one boat left in a port. You score up all the different locations on your, your personal player board, and the person with the highest score wins. I like Emotep. I'll be honest. I don't love Emotep. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, some of what happened with Emotep is I knock stuff over all the time. <laughs> with the towers of cubes and it got a little frustrating for me because I'm clumsy and I own that and I'm not going to blame Emotep for that. Mm-hmm. But I loved Emotep the Duel. These Cosmos two-player games, I feel like the two-player player limitation lets you really fine-tune and balance tightly. That worker placement mechanism with the row and the columns and the boats and the planning ahead and the possibilities to have your plans thwarted and you're trying to optimize and timing is a thing it clicked so hard i'm a fan of this game it is a winner in the cosmos two-player game certainly if i only have two players i'm gonna pull this out instead of emotep flat out every time but i'm just gonna pull this out anyway because the game is (laughs) the game is delightful i love clever worker placement Emotep is clever worker placement, and I encourage you all to check it out if you have two players. Now, Mandy, you said you've played it, but I know that two-player games are a little harder for you to get to the table sometimes. Yeah, so this one I've actually played a few times. uh, I mean, I had a a two-player game day, I guess, so any two-player games, we got some to the table, and this was one of them. And I kind of felt the same as you with Imhotep, the original. It was like, it was fine. Uh, this one I really enjoyed. I feel, though, like the you can... I don't want to say it's mean, but, like, I mean, it's only two players. Someone's coming for you. I mean, hello, yeah. There's all, there are yeah. only two of you. So you really feel the sting in this one. But That's not, fair. But Absolutely. it's not horrible. You know what I mean? I mean, you know what's coming to a certain degree, you know that, hey, if I don't want this person to get ahead, I'm going to have to say, oh, I'm taking this row. And they're like, oh, I needed the column. Well, too bad for you. It's part part and parcel, right? It's it, it's part of the whole thing. So, But it doesn't leave me feeling upset about it. It's part of the game. So I, I really enjoyed this one. And again, I, I'm, I'm liking that two-player series like Targi. I have only played recently, and I loved it. So, That's because it's excellent. It's so good. So good. And now let's look at the digital side of board game with Tap That App. All right. I feel like it's been a while since we've had, a, you know, an app that we've talked about. But this is perfect because we just played it on our show, Aptastic. So we are going to be talking about the game Epic. So I'm going to let Suzanne take it away because there's just so much to talk about here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Epic is Designed by Rob Doherty and Darwin Castle of Star Realms fame. The art is by Callie Dutton and Vito Gazzaldi. And it's published by White Wizard. Now, Epic is kind of like a CCG, TCG style game, but without the chasing, without the ultra rares and things like that. It's You get a deck of cards. It's packed and you can go wallop each other out of the box. Now, cards have factions. I forget what the official term for it is, but there's good and evil and sage and mm-hmm. wise or something like that. I Forgetting forget. the, uh, yeah, there's four factions, four but factions, they yeah. are also associated with colors. So blue, green, red, and yellow. Mm-hmm. And basically, What happens is you battle each other and you are trying to knock each other's health points out by causing damage created by the champions and events that you play out of your hand. Because cards are going to have a few traits to them. Mm -hmm. Some are going to be champions, which is essentially a, a fighter for you, and some of them will be events. And some will have a cost of one gold, and some will have a cost of no gold. But that's it. And it's one of the interesting things about Epic is they've completely thrown away kind of traditional CCG tenants of an economy. 
in terms of mana or energy or things like that. They're like, eh, we're going to get rid of that. We want to be unique. And Epic is unique in that front. So you're going to get a gold on your turn and on your opponent's turn to spend on a card if you want to. And cards only cost one gold or no gold. And either you spend it or you don't. Typically, you want to spend it. And that's all there is to the costing. When you go out there, you're going to be attacking. There is kind of a traditional attack with a a champion, block with a champion kind of thing. But there is an interesting battle rhythm compared to other kinds of similar games in which you're going to attack. Your opponent gets to respond. If they respond, you get to respond and you can keep on attacking. So you're going to be looking at your characters and determining how to break them up into squadrons to attack with in different waves to try to really optimize and break through and wipe out your opponent. You're going to be trying to draw out, you're going to be paying attention to whether or not they have a gold left and trying to draw out their auto defense or or kind of wipe cards and things like that. And there's a a lot of the mental game in it on that front as well. You're going to keep on hammering at each other, trying to cleverly combine your gold spend with your champions, leveraging things like play card play bonuses called tribute bonuses that you get a special ability one time when you play the card or leveraging loyalty. That's when you have similarly suited cards in your hand that you can reveal to boost a card and then knock your opponent to the ground. (laughs) I mean, that's a pretty simple overview of a pretty intricate game, but hopefully that did it justice from an overview point of view. Now, Mandy, you and I went at it in Epic the Card Game on Aptastic. And how did it end yeah. up? <laughs> oh, let's start off by saying, I think I played the tutorial like five times, but it's not because they did a bad job. It's just there was a lot. So I was trying to, you know, strategize and I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't know there was so much going on. Like, it's a good thing. Uh, and I mean, it worked out. We both won a game apiece. That's always nice. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, we can't complain. Uh, I definitely think it's a game you have to play it a lot. In order to really, like, for us, we had to read everything on the cards because we're just not familiar with all of the terminology. Uh, But I thought overall it looked really nice. I mean, I was very excited to get some gold and buy some of, you know, the fun things in the app. Because, you know, if you want to jazz up your deck a little bit, you know, there are options to do that. Uh, And definitely, uh, you know, getting those different backgrounds is really fun. So it definitely could be a thing where, you know, you, you are immersed in this game there's just a lot, which is great because it'll keep you coming back for more. So I think this is one we'll probably revisit, I hope, on the show sure. now that I've <laughs> I've practiced a little bit. Uh, no, and absolutely. Yeah. It was definitely one. So Epic is a game that's been in development for years, See, just oh, years, because I've had like beta that. access for years. So I know how long they've been working on it. Oh. And they are, you know, Star Realms is one of the best digital card games out there. Yep. So, of course we had high expectations for Epic. Now, Epic, the app version, is available on iOS, Android, and Steam. And Uh similar to Star Realms, it's free. You can download this for free and really play a very rich experience for no money. Now, there is in-game currency that you can spend, but it's pretty much just used for competitive play purposes. So Mm -hmm. if you're an Uber player, then yeah, you may want to invest in the game. Uh, But for casual players, really, the currency is just used to buy things like Mandy was talking about with different backgrounds, different avatars, uh, the ability to craft more decks because car- deck crafting and deck building is absolutely not deck building, the deck building mechanism, <laughs> but building <laughs> constructed decks right, for competitive exactly. play is definitely a thing. But the fact that they launched this for free is really, really great and gives everybody a chance to really feel it out and try it before they invest and realize how it works for them or or how it doesn't. Mm -hmm. There is a tutorial that Mandy and I are well familiar with at this point. (laughs) There is online play, as we've shown in Aptastic, but there is AI play as well. And there's a number of different ways that you can play against an AI. You can do constructed, you can do draft, you can do random 30. Because one of the things about Epic is that they also tried to address the deck construction challenge Mm. that so many TCGs and CCGs have. With Epic, you can literally take, shuffle up the cards you have, draw 30 cards, and play a game. They call it random 30. It is a official format. And sure, will you have all the loyalty synergies you want? Nah. 
But will you have a playable fun game? Chances are, yeah. And I think that's another super clever thing about Epic. Like Star Realms 2, there's also a campaign mode in the app. So if you like that kind of escalating challenge that, one, builds your skills, but always presents kind of more and more difficult gameplay, solo gameplay options as you go, they've built that in too. So from a features point of view, Epic is really rich on that front. It has just about all the bells and whistles that I ask for when I'm playing a board game app. You definitely won't be bored. Let's put it that way. I'm still trying to figure out how to not attack in packs. That's just a little tip, FYI. <laughs> just one, just one. I didn't know. That's I thought kidding. more meant better. <laughs> and in some, in some ways it could. You certainly, whenever you did that and I chose to block, you wiped my champions out. They were well, gone. Something Done clicked so. there. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but Epic doesn't have kind of the easy entry in some ways that a game like Star Realms has, which right. is a deck builder, totally different type of game. But compared to like a CCG, mm-hmm. I think Epic does accomplish what it wants to do in terms of not relying on a massive meta in order for people to get some enjoyment out of the game and providing that competitive card play feel without necessarily having to invest your entire life in knowing the ins and outs of deck construction. And for me, as a casual player who does not have time to devote to a lifestyle game, I really find that appealing. If you don't like those kinds of card battlers, whether it's card wars or magic or wyvern or what have you, then maybe this isn't going to be for you. But if you like those types of games and are similar that maybe you just can't keep up, Epic is definitely worth a try. And if you just like competitive card games in general, I think that this is a solid one. Really, from an app an app point of view, overall, very, very happy with implementation in app form. And hey, at the big cost of no monies to try it. And with the availability on pretty much every digital platform you'd want, give it a whirl. What do you say, Mandy? Oh, absolutely. And don't give up. Because, <laughs> no, I have to say that because once you do the tutorial, especially if you're not familiar with these types of game or, you know, you're just kind of dipping your feet in, you're going to be like, oh, my goodness, what is going on? Give yourself a few goes at it because you really have to become acquainted with some of the language. And then I I, I have to tell you, it kind of falls into place a little bit after that and you feel a bit more confident. So don't give up after a play. Give it a few plays before, you know, you make a decision. But overall, I enjoyed it. I was playing it a little today, actually. And I think we're building up to a pretty epic grudge match at some point, Mandy, because we've gone one and one in two different games now. So I know this we, means we I'm, gotta getting, settle it. I'm getting better. Yay. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Mandy, 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 Suzanne. Suze, how many games can you fit in a suitcase? Should I pre order this game from the Tokyo Game Market? Can you confirm or deny that deep dish pizza is a type of pie? And now, the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, which way did the Kikurumi party? It's been a little bit since we had a Q&A. We're, we're running, we've had a nice solid episode, so let's just do a few of the questions, and if we miss any, we'll, we'll get back to the others in another episode. But uh, Mandy, why don't you kick us off? All right, so I'm going to start with uh, what see what Anthony has to say. I loved the live show at Dice Tower West. Seeing the big gang, sorry we missed you, Mandy, <laughs> was way Aww. more fun than I thought it would be. It was my Wait first... Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, because I wasn't there, right? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first convention, and thank you to everyone at the Dice Tower who made it excellent. I wanted to ask you about game storage. I saw your travel kit, so I'm assuming this is for you, Suzanne. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't get to try and play a roll and write with you, and was wondering if you have other travel tips for games. There were great games in the library, but it seems like having a few games in a bag would be a nice fallback. Thanks for everything you do at the Dice Tower. Oh, that's quite nice. Well, Anthony, I am glad you had a good time at Dice Tower West. I think it is one of the most wonderful things when we're in one of the group shows and Tom asks, or Tim, one of the organizers, asks, who how many people is this your first convention and you see all these hands shoot up that's actually really rewarding because i think it makes people it it implies that people feel comfortable trying it out and i know that at a convention like dice tower they will 
have a really high chance of having a positive first experience. Absolutely. But, um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> game storage, travel games. I don't know, Mandy. I mean, you've got your thoughts here too. So definitely I have this amazing travel kit of roll and write games where I've just laminated a bunch of sheets and then I've kind of combined components as much as I can. Mm -hmm. A number of roll and write games use just standard colored D6s. Well, you don't need to carry dice for, you know, you just need one set and those will often cover a number of games. So I've tried to do that. I keep, you know, the cards for a Metro X and a Welcome To in the box and some dry erase pens. But really between these two kind of five by seven photo boxes that I use, I carry 15 roll and writes with me. And it's really, really great because roll and write games are wonderful to introduce and play with strangers. They're relatively easy to teach. They're relatively quick to play. And most of the time you can find one that appeals to the person across the table. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, Mandy, uh, I know you have one of these as well, but I have what's called a quiver mm -hmm. that's very popular among my friends. It is a very high quality kind of vinyl leather like case that I don't know, it looks like a it's a long rectangular box, but it's like leather and it like zips open and it's padded on the inside. It has all these different dividers. And what you can do is just take out a bunch of little card games or sometimes not other games as well. Mm -hmm. So like a six nymph and a no yeah. thanks and uh, um, the builders and what other games have I had in my quiver? Um, Sail to India I've had or any of these wonderful Sashi and Sashi card games. Mm -hmm. All Any of those, you just d take them out of the box. There's a little place where you can even put the rule books yeah. and you can pack a ton of games in this little card holder and then just carry that around with you. And then you have a, a pretty big selection of games right there with you if you're if you're traveling. And I, I find that works quite well, um, too. I don't know, Mandy, how about you? Any other kind of games to take on the go? I'm trying to think. Well, I got a new Quiver case. I don't remember the technical term. They, I think they had launched it on Kickstarter. It's a more square. Oh, the small one, the Bolt? Yeah, the Bolt. And that one was really good because I have um, Claim. And Claim is oh, a two-player, yeah. but I really like introducing that game to people. And there are a ton of, I, I wouldn't necessarily say expansions, you just get different kind of factions that you can play with. And so that fits really nicely in there. So I, I love doing that, uh, bringing that one to show people. I think it's really good. But you listed a lot of the ones that I generally have in my mm -hmm. case, if I bring in my larger case, like Roll and Rights always go to card games are usually mm -hmm. a kind of a good way to go. I think Fuji Flush was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> Played that one a ton. Uh, so games like that generally tend to be really fun. Uh, I think you covered a lot of them. Yeah, but I mean, I think for travel in general, look for alternate storage. I think that that's a big one. The other thing I've seen people do is take a big box game, mm -hmm. like your standard ticket to ride size box, but get rid of all the inserts and then put other games in there. You know, uh, we I all see. know those huge boxes where the components don't fill up the box, but you still yep. like the game. So I've seen <laughs> that where you can kind of put four, five, six games, sometimes even big games, right? Because if you've yep. got that larger box, you can put multiple boards in and things like that. So sometimes if you're on the go, you can fit a lot of games in just a single box. Might be a little heavy, sure, but that makes it much more portable, right? And just carry that with you. And then you have some options to throw down, whether you're you know, going on a trip, going on a weekend trip or something and want to have games. You know, when you go to the hotel and they have a game shelf and it's got like yeah. two old copies of Monopoly and a copy of Trivial Pursuit from 1972. <laughs> that's very specific, by the way. That's very specific. 1972. <laughs> well, that's because that's... That's what it is in all these hotels, I'm telling you. But uh, yeah, those are just some ideas for travel. And hey, everybody out there, if you have yeah. additional travel ideas, I mean, Mandy, you're going to Europe soon. I'm sure if, if somebody has some clever idea, you don't know. You can't all see it, but I'm going to bring the crew. I just got it in and it has cards and looks like it would fit in something small. So I will be hey, bringing Mandy, the crew. Holding up the game box to the Skype window, it doesn't really play on radio and podcasts. I'm just saying. You can hear the dice in the box. <laughs> there's, there's no dice in Die Crew. I mean the cards in the box. <laughs> That's Alrighty. so embarrassing. <laughs> we're moving on. Just for your sake, Mandy, we're moving on. Uh, Marisol asks, with coronavirus shutting down China production, how bad will this impact game ship dates? Are publishers worried? 
Will we see price increases? Hmm. What do you think about this? This is interesting. Yeah, it's it's definitely China was impacted. I in my role in helping restoration games, which I help them behind the scenes as kind of a project manager and marketing advisor. Um, I've seen this, right? I, I've talked to manufacturers and they've literally had to shut down. Like China said, shut down. Yeah. You can't work. And then factories had to go through a um, an approval process. They had to petition to reopen. Oh, wow. And then, you know, China was, the government was so, solely allowing factories back based on how uh, important their work was. Mm-hmm. Will it impact ship dates? Are publishers worried? It may. Sure. It may impact ship dates. Are publishers worried? I don't know if worried is the right word. I think they're pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And I think they are coming up with contingency plans. I know at Dice Tower West, when I was talking to publishers and asking about when games would be, instead of hearing, oh, that's my Gen Con release, or oh, that'll be out at Origins, I heard... It's planned for Origins. Got it. Or we're hoping to have it out in September. So it's very clear that they think there could be schedules at risk. Um, In terms of price increases, which is funny because this email came in just a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. But just today on the day we're recording... Asmodee announced price increases right? <laughs> on their titles, which I don't think Marisol knew about when they wrote in. Right. But will we see price re- increases because of the COVID-19? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that specifically would drive price increases. Now, will we see price increases for a variety of other reasons, whether it be sure. tariffs or just cost of materials and inflation? So that's a different issue. But price increases due to COVID-19, that one I'm not worried about personally. Yeah. So, I mean, you have a better kind of insight on this than I do working, you know, with a publisher. Uh, I'm the price increase. I I think I find that surprising other than the tariffs and whatnot. I don't think I personally don't think it would happen. I'm assuming you would have a contract with people and you would have to adhere to the pricing that was already stipulated. But again, I I'm not 100% positive on that. So it's kind of weird timing that the asthma day thing happened yeah, yeah. so I, that kind of negates what i'm saying but i i don't know i don't think that'll well, be an I across think the board thing. asthma day's announcement had anything to do with i think asthma day right. said hey the price of tickets ride has been the same for 15 years but the cost of materials has gone up in the last 15 years so right what are we gonna do right exactly all right and to wrap up sean says hello oh nice mandy nice first i want to start <laughs> off by saying Boo, Suzanne. (laughs) Thanks, Sean. So glad you're reading this. But Sean goes on to say, I have five sweet and wonderful little ferrets, and they are my babies. And Sean, I'm very happy for you, and I am sure your ferrets are wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) Sean listens all the way through the post credits. (laughs) Right? (laughs) But Sean did have a question. I am wondering what your opinion is on forfeiting games. Several times I have forfeited, oh, several times I have forfeited a game only to be called a poor sport. But the reason I forfeited wasn't out of poor sportsmanship. It was out of us wanting, it was out of wanting us to be able to start a new game. Generally, when I forfeit, it is when there are only two of us left in the game. There's no way I'll be able to win. The current game will still take a while to play out. And there are people sitting out, either due to player elimination or arriving after the game started. I feel like this is better than making others wait for the game finish. And it's not like I'm depriving the other player of the win. What do you think? Is it poor sportsmanship to forfeit instead of playing the game out? So, oh boy. I... Personally, I'm saying I personally, I understand where you're coming from. And I think it's great that you're taking into account other people's feelings, especially people who may have just arrived and wanted to play the game and they don't want to sit out. But I think people coming into that that scene, like I know if I come to an event and I'm maybe a bit late, I expect that people are playing a game. So I either bring a game to amuse myself or sometimes I'll just hang out while people are playing a game. Oh, and I'm listening to them playing the game because perhaps it's a game I want to play later, like not disturbing, but kind of hanging out as they're playing. So it turns into more of a group kind of atmosphere. Not disturbing that you know of. Well, oh. my friends are pretty vocal. I'm I'm 100% sure they would tell me. <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, they're totally listening. So they're, they're probably laughing as I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for me personally, I, I wouldn't forfeit a game. And you're talking to someone who 
uh, goes to a game night and I, you know, welcome people in. And obviously we try our best to stagger it so people aren't sitting out by themselves. So, you know, we kind of don't start a game till later. So we do that in advance of playing and split off the groups that way. But I think, I don't want to say quitting, but leaving a game before it's finished, even though hey, I'm not going to win. I I just don't think it's fair to everybody else who I'm the type of person I like to see it through, even though fine. I know, yes, maybe I won't win, but I actually want to see the game through to the end. I'm much like that when reading a book. It could be the worst book in the world, but I just need to finish it. So maybe it's just the completionist in me. I don't know. Uh, I know some people generally feel a little off about people just kind of leaving a game, but if there's a valid reason, I get it. So for me personally, no, I I wouldn't leave a game. I'm not judging you for doing that. But just be aware (laughs) that I think you might find people might look a little like, oh, that's an interesting take. But elimination games that he mentioned, there's a reason I don't play those games for the reason that you're talking about people sitting out and not being involved. So I have an issue with elimination games, but that's a whole other subject. So hopefully that answers your question. I had a lot going on there. (laughs) No, I, I totally get where you're coming from, both both Sean and, and sure. you, Mandy. I think the key line here is the, that Sean's being called a poor sport. Yeah. Now, Sean very clearly has the best of intentions sure. and is actually quite thoughtful about it. Absolutely. But the fact that the players in their group are calling them a poor sport, I think, is the key there. Mm. So this is not the group to do that with. Yeah. Maybe you feel them out. Hey, it's pretty obvious you're going to win. And Mandy and Tom just arrived. Do you want to call it and we'll just call in? Or do you want to play it out? And then if they say, oh, yeah, let's just call it, then approval sure. achieved. But they might say, similar to what you were just saying, Mandy, no, I'd really like to see this play out. Um. And then, and then you've kind of had discussion instead of just saying, I forfeit, you win, right. let's pack it up. Right. And, and maybe that discussion is, is even more of it. So to me, I probably, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's poor sportsmanship, especially if I understand your motivations behind sure. it. Sure. But it's going to be pretty rare, I think, that I would want that to happen, especially if it's a game I'm not familiar, like it's a new game. I would right. really not like that. I think it sounds like maybe just a little more of dialogue before decisions like that right. are made might help. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I think having that discussion uh, beforehand versus just saying, okay, I'm out because now it's just about you and, you know, there are other people playing. So I definitely think having the discussion and coming to a consensus, I think that's your your best bet. But elimination games, just read the rules. If you know someone's going to be sitting out for like 20 minutes, eh, then maybe that's not the game to play. Maybe with this specific group. I don't know, just an idea. <laughs> And I mean, look at how we've played things like Shards of Infinity or Epic yeah. against each other, right? And that game of Epic, I knew I was toast. I knew I was toast. But we played it through because we wanted to see how it ended and all that other stuff. So. Well, and you never know. Look at that second game. I thought 100% I had you. And then, of course, I attacked with a group. And, well, here we are. One to <laughs> one. <laughs> all right, folks. We are at time. We will call that a wrap Send us your questions. We've got a few more. We're sorry we didn't get to it, but we will put them in our next session. But feel free to drop us more. You can email me at Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And you can email me at Mandy, that's Mandy with an I, at Dicetower.com. As always, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Dice Tower. We appreciate you being here and being part of the greater Dice Tower community and family. Thank you so much for your support. Next episode is 651. And Tom and Eric will be back looking 15 years in the past to their top games of 2005. Until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Roy Canaday and Rob Searing. 
Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it's that time again, two truths and a lie. And well, I'm up first with my two truths and a lie from last episode. I like books written by Margaret Atwood. I like books written by Paula Hawkins. And I like books written by Louisa May Alcott. If you said that I like books written by Paula Hawkins is the lie, that would be correct. Actually, I have not read anything by oh. Paula Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Suzanne? Okay, last episode I said, I've had a pet named Puddles, I've had a pet named Orion, and I've had a pet named Ringo. And the lie is that I've had a pet named Ringo. Maybe next time. Interesting. Okay, I like where that's going. All right, new this episode, here we go. I can do a pirouette on point. I have met Kelly McGillis, and I used to dress like Cindy Lauper fun time (laughs) oh my goodness i can't wait and for me i went in a very different direction mandy (laughs) i like tofu i like impossible burgers and i like tempeh okay yeah we definitely did well there you have it everyone good luck